Uh, summer is here. Nice time to sit back, relax, and not actually be outside at the beach, but just kind of use video editing to make it seem like we are. I got a nice air control system going on here. It's blowing every which way. I, I'm not feeling the heat at all. Oh, yeah. No, I'm, I'm sitting inside of a balmy 60 right now with an you actual know, working air conditioning. Woohoo, new house. You know, this is nice. Yeah. Just sitting, relaxing, not not having a movie or two. Yeah, at a minimum. <laughs> at a minimum. <laughs> Occasionally we hit up a third one, maybe in a separate episode. Yeah. Maybe a third. <laughs> yeah, just kind of just kind of a casual one this time around, people. It's we kind of figured, you know, we've been around for a while by the way you should probably introduce ourselves i'm your host Stuart, <laughs> and i'm your host uh jacob yeah yeah <laughs> hey, that's the tell, ticket it's it's very casual not even doing the right you know structure yet no i'm completely lost yeah <laughs> thrown to the wolves yeah i don't even know what's going on anymore uh-huh. am i even in an air-conditioned room or am i outside am i really at the beach hmm that'd be kind of weird no but also uncomfortable <laughs> there's no beach Oh, but also good. No more beach. They're banned. Okay, fair enough. But yeah, we uh, we we've been doing this for a little while, and I'd say our abilities in this have gone up at least a little bit. And so maybe you've not been a, not been too aware of who we are as people, or maybe we just haven't fleshed it out a whole lot. And so we just kind of decided, hey, let's make a uh, a more recent thing I to say. Let's just kind of just answer some questions about each other, you know? Yeah, I agree. Did did you, uh, real quick, did you just hear that drive by? Did that get picked up on the mic, that really loud, uh... I didn't hear anything, though. Okay. A man with a very large penis just drove by on a oh. motorcycle and made a loud noise, so... Well, well, that's good. All right, I just wanted to make sure that didn't get picked up. No, that's fine. Anyways. <laughs> yeah, just, uh, we each kind of came up with a series of questions that we'll be asking each other of um you know not necessarily straightforward questions in fact i don't think any of them would be considered straightforward in most cases but you know they're at least semi-movie related just kind of tangentially movie related (laughs) yeah so that we can at least have an excuse for it but otherwise we're just kind of like let's let's see what the the answers we can come up with these kind of things you know yeah if you hear paper rustling around, I definitely wrote down all of my questions because I couldn't remember just remember them. I, I just took screenshots of our conversation on, on the text. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I won't lie. I was going to write them down, but I was like, I don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not feeling it. Yeah. <laughs> I've been typing plenty today. Okay. I mean, same, but... Oh, yeah. All right, but uh, do you want to do you want to take the helm? Sure. Let's Stuart, see. take the wheel. <laughs> Stuart, take the wheel. Hmm. Oh, you have so many good questions. Ooh, this one. Uh, if you can make remake any film, what would it be, and for what reason? If I personally if you... could remake any film. Yes. Hmm. And then I'll obviously answer that same question after you answer. I, uh, hmm, that's that's really hard. You know, there's there's, I, I've I've said this before on the show. I really think that the per, the prime instance of something to be remade is something that wasn't done perfectly the first time around, or that has a lot of flaws. Right, as it should be. So there's plenty of like B horror stuff that I would want to redo or try to take take up again like uh the stuff oh or, yeah or terror vision or mm-hmm. things like that mm-hmm. uh ghoulies hobgoblins <laughs> <laughs> any ed wood ones uh no just like the they're in such an echelon of you know the bad good whatever i don't think that you could i think those come back around to you shouldn't touch them Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it it also has to be something people really don't care about, too. And I mean, Ed Wood had his own film. Oh yeah. Well, the Tim Burton. That's what I meant. Um. Oh God, Tim Burton again. <laughs> no, we're getting away from that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what what about what about you? This one I had to think on 
for a while because there's not a whole lot of like because me like just as a baseline i don't really think a lot of stuff should be remade i think it just kind of needs to let it lie where it is but then i kind of thought about it, it's like what about a movie that just kind of failed to make an imp- as good of an impression as it should have and so i thought of um uh treasure planet the animated film i do it as a live action one but i really do think you know it got fucking railed by disney for lack of advertising and everything and so it's was such a failure in the box office that just kind of only had cold to claim i think it really deserves like a more grand release you know that's uh that's definitely a movie we could kind of uh talk about at some point in the future because you know treasure island oh shit so that is something that we could cover and i'm interested to revisit that again because i watched it and i really was not a fan Mm -hmm. and that's mainly i know why they did it i know the point of it but i'm not a fan of them mixing the space style with like the victorian style it's you know the steampunk aspect i'm not a big i'm not a big fan of the meshes that happen there Oh, it's a, that's exactly the reason why I love it. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. I, just, I love I love fucking like pirates and like, you know, I guess, I guess that will. I, I guess I'm trying to think of what that age would technically be. It's like between, it's like post-colonial but like pre-Victorian. So like, yeah, I don't know. It's like <laughs> Napo- Napoleonic. That would be it. Like Napoleonic the... code. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I hear you. Oh yeah, but yeah, that one I would love to see like a live action boot of that, just to see like with modern visual technologies and everything. Yeah, I think, that, I think it'd be kick ass. That's a good. That's a good idea. A Disney could get around to it someday. Live action remake. Oh yeah, that and the Atlantis one. Oh yeah, that is a movie I I do love. So mm-hmm. I think it's good enough on its own to not really need a remake. But. Yeah, I need to watch it again. Well, it mm. got the sequel, Milo Returns. Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure it did. It certainly was something. Yes, okay. Your, your turn, Lon Frere. I'll take it. Uh, so, uh, what would you say mm-hmm. is the most iconic or the most influential scene in all of film? Ooh. Um... There's a lot of big influential ones that might not be as well known. I think, you know, the the one that comes to mind is the scene in the first Godfather where the main character shoots and kills the two men in the diner. That one's a pretty good one. Um, but that one's not as iconic. If I had to just pick iconic, I'd have to say the, um, you know, the the scene from Star Wars Episode Five. You know, the "No, I am your father" scene. I think that's the one that basically everyone in the world who at least have has some knowledge of movies would know that scene at least from some clip at some point oh it, yeah it's just it's so repeated it's so consistently brought up as like the biggest like plot twist in like movie history and that sort of thing and it kind of set the bar for it at that point so i'd say it's also in uh, one of the most influential yeah no i i would agree with that mm-hmm. it's just, it's it's hard to pick a most influential one specifically because there's so many older movies that just kind of set the bar either through filming technique or just actors quality of performance and everything it's kind of hard to pick one in particular but as far as one i think everyone would know it would definitely have to be uh you know the star wars scene okay what about you that's good what about oh um there's there's plenty of scenes in citizen kane i'd oh, yeah. say you know that's like a movie that not a lot of people have well a, a fair amount of people but not a lot of people have actually watched the movie or sat through the whole thing because at least in my opinion it's really boring oh but, absolutely um, but it my god it with it, some of its techniques uh i mean the rosebud with the dropping of the snow globe uh mm-hmm cane at the rally and behind him is the large poster of his face with the with his name on it uh there's a ton of scenes from that that i would say are iconic and they've been aped to death Mm -hmm. in other forms of media 
Um, but if we're going for something more along the lines of the Star Wars thing, uh, just as iconic, you know, so in the public consciousness, I think that, uh, I don't know, like the, the King of the World thing from Titanic would probably be up there. Ooh, yeah, that's a big one. That's one that everyone knows. I have not sat through the entirety of Titanic because I was bored, but I mean, oh, I knew that scene going in. Oh, it absolutely is. And that, and that one actually goes into a potential answer I have later. <laughs> oh, oh, for a question you, okay. Yeah. I won't say whose question it would be. It just, you know, it, it just rang a bell. <laughs> well, just throw the whole thing off track. Why don't you? <laughs> I'm giving potential teases. Okay, well, uh, uh, okay, back to you. Yes. Back on you. Ooh, are you pro or anti colorization? That it being, Ooh. you know, previously black and white films being colorized in a more modern format. Am you Ted Turner? <laughs> uh, actually, uh, so I'm anti colorization mm -hmm. due to what I've seen from it. But I don't think it's inherently a bad thing in practice. Okay. I just haven't seen it done well. Do I think that they need that black and white films need to be restored? No, I don't. I don't think that. But where we are in a period of time where media is so easily accessible and it's like it's impossible to lose formats of media. Like, right. there, there was the recent debate with uh, the Simpsons thing because of all the stuff that happened with Michael Jackson. Uh, a lot of producers decided the, the premiere episode to season three would be pulled from, hmm. like, airing or from being re redistributed on CDs, DVDs, streaming, whatever, because Michael Jackson is a prominent figure in it. Uh, and there's a side plot, you know, him staying at the house with Bart and whatever. So it, it's kind of creepy ah. okay. <laughs> in hindsight. Fair enough. But we're in an age where them pulling that does not mean that it's lost media. Mm -hmm. I literally have it on DVD in a season set right now when you can find it online all over the place. So I think we're in a position where if there were techniques used to just to restore black and white films with like colors added to them, if you wanted to do that, that's fine. I don't see why you would do that, but I don't have anything against it because... It's not destroying the original property, I guess. Right. Well, that that's my thought about on, on it. What about what about you? I'm definitely anti for it. Just like I guess like just for like the straightforward answer, I really do think, you know, movies when they're first created are of their time and are of their context and they need to be preserved as such. Like I'm still I'm reminded of um oh, I'm it was a uh, Warner Brother. It was a, um, a Warner Brothers disclaimer to whenever they re-released a whole bunch of older shorts and that sort of thing, um, where it's, it basically said at the front of it, a lot of these things were based on older, like terribly racist preconceptions and that sort of thing. I th and you know, to whitewash these or to change them or to destroy them would be to do an injustice to the people that it is hurt. And so we are showing it as it was of the time. Like as it was unedited, it's like that's right. a more that's a more negative <laughs> example of it, obviously. But yeah. like, I have the same mindset of it. It's like it just seems very, you know, new age. Oh, we they we we know better. Like we know better than what these people would have known. We should do it the way that we think is right. It's like no. It's like these guys, these people were able to make this film what would you know, most typically be a great film by using the technology they had at hand and it was considered great at the time with or without color and so leave it as i think it should be left as it is okay i definitely see where you're coming from it's uh it's funny when you brought up the warner brothers shorts i didn't think you were going to go in that direction yeah. of the the racist disclaimer that Whoopi goldberg gave um, oh right i thought that i thought you were going to bring up the the porky and wacky land looney tune short that they colorized Oh, that one, I didn't even remember that one. But, well, I mean, that's a good point. Yeah. I yeah. I, I don't even remember if it was that bad, that bad of a color job or not. It should, de in theory, it should be easier with cartoons anyways, but. Oh, yeah. Anyways. <laughs> yeah, I just think, I just think 
things made of their time should be kept as they are because uh, we don't do that with any other form of media with the exception of maybe video games but i think video games are fall under kind of a different situation entirely um but it's like you know we don't remaster the mona lisa we only like we preserve it but we don't try to like oh these colors are faded and not as you know palatable to the modern eye let's color it differently or something yeah right so, you know i just think it needs to stay as it is if only for the sake if only for respect of the original creators that that's fair that's fair mm. um okay so uh, da, 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 da. yes uh Give me one. Oh, what's this uh who would you rather be stuck in a room with jack nicholson or al pacino this one i when i wrote it like i was kind of thinking um I, I in my head i had i guess a younger al pacino because i i think of him al pacino in the modern day he's chilled out a lot more i think it, it's like you know if like modern day current age you know jack nicholson and al pacino i definitely pick al pacino he seems like he'd be more pleasant in general i think jack nicholson just through all all ages might be kind of annoying and the fact that he's just off the fucking wall um <laughs> But if I had to pick like a younger, like like the younger ones, or it's like you know, Jack. I mean Jack Nicholson has been in movies all his life, um, but I think I've I had to pick either the Jack Nicholson we saw in, um, oh dang it, I keep forgetting its name, uh, The Departed, or Al Pacino as we saw in Scarface. I think I'd pick Jack Nicholson because like he seems kind of like in his prime his career. He probably has some insane stories to tell. Versus, like, 1970s Al Pacino would probably be a dick. <laughs> so, and plus, also, like, scary. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, Jack Nicholson, at the very least, you know, at least interesting, if maybe a little creepy. <laughs> it's just, you know, that's that's the most I can think of on that moment. No, that I agree. I agree. Uh, that was, that. I mean, that's sort of my thought process, too, uh-huh. is... Uh, when I read it and I thought about it, I was like, well, it, it came to me almost instantly. I was like, well, Jack Nicholson, because I feel like Al Pacino, not even a character that he's played, but the actor himself would be more likely to try and kill me <laughs> just exactly. because of the way he is. Yeah. And Jack Nicholson has been in the industry for a very long time. He was in Roger Corman pictures very <laughs> early on. I feel like he has great stories to tell. And I know I've brought it up on the podcast before. But that book, uh, Hello, I Must Be Going, about mm. Groucho Marx in his later years. Right, right, uh, yeah. He, he was a, Groucho was a large fan of Jack Nicholson and constantly had Jack over at the house for dinners. And <laughs> at Groucho's dinners, he would invite a few people over. They would all sit at the table, eat and talk. And then afterwards, everyone was expected to perform for everyone else at uh, doing a task that they weren't normally doing like or that they weren't known for like jack nicholson was an actor so maybe he'd be trying to play the piano or something uh (laughs) and i feel like there would be a lot of interesting stories not like just from those experiences with groucho that i would really want to hear about yeah that that would be pretty interesting so it'd be be like talking to ed gould oh yeah i would love to sit down with like elliot gould Elliot and, Gould. I, um, I don't know where Ed came from. What? I, I said Ed Gould, not Elliot Gould. Oh, I didn't even pick up on. I didn't even pick up on that. Yeah, I don't, I don't know where Ed came from. I don't know. I'd love to have a roundtable with a bunch of those people and just have them talk at me. I would have nothing to give to the conversation. I guess a fly on the wall would be a better example like, of that. Truth be told, Jake, I, something tells me you'd be able to give a, a comment or two that would be fucking hilarious to them. <laughs> I would hope so, but I dare I dare it not to dream. <laughs> I mean, fair enough. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'd probably you know I, I'd like to believe I'd be I'd give a good comment talking to one of my heroes or something, but I'd be like, yeah, probably not. <laughs> yeah, we can, like I said, we, yeah, we can only dream in that scenario. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You ready for your next one? Oh yes. Oh yes, certainly yes. <laughs> Uh, ooh, uh, what is the first picture you remember seeing in theaters? Ooh, okay, uh, Tarzan. Yeah, I, I was, I, one, one, I'm, one of mine is 
probably like tar- Tarzan. I'm not positive for sure, but yeah, I got to respect you, that one. Really? Yeah, um, I mean, we're about the same age. Roughly, yeah, we are. Um, yeah. Anim- yeah, the animated Tarzan came out in, what, 99? I believe so, yeah. So I would have been four. And I remember very little about the movie except for the Trashing the Camp song. Uh, <laughs> so that that is definitely my earliest memory of seeing a film in theaters. Um, earliest memory of seeing an entire movie in theaters, like the whole thing. <laughs> not yeah. bits and pieces would definitely be uh um oh what was that it, it, uh the second harry potter uh chamber of secrets ah when that came out hmm. not bad what about you i you said tarzan I'm, but i'm i it could be tarzan um i'm but i'm all but certain it was um toy story 2 um toy story 2 oh that was yep. 2001 correct I, I think I think it was earlier, wasn't it? I thought it was like ninety nine as well. Ninety nine. Hmm. It might no. have been. You know what? I, I wonder. Jim I'm, Varney had died because he wasn't Slinky Dog. Right. And Curious, also, and, sir. and also, I don't think I got. I don't think I ever went to films like into the theater for a while. Like I had seen a lot of movies at home. I know the very first movie I had seen all the way through was Toy Story one, but. I th- I'm pretty sure the first one why I saw it in theaters was Toy Story 2. It's a, it was either because I'm, yeah, I definitely didn't see Tarzan in theaters because we had we got a VHS of it and then we wa- I watched it to death. Oh um, okay. Yeah, so I'm, I want to say tar- uh, Toy Story 2. The first one I remember seeing all the way through, in like that vein. Ooh, the, the problem is, is like I don't. The problem is, is that my memory is just kind of full of holes in general. Not for any particular reason. I just have a shitty memory. The first yeah, one I can that's remember, where the intrigue comes in. Right. The first one I... The earliest one that just sticks out to me, just as, a, like, you know, a big film for me, would have been Star Wars Episode Three. Cause like, oh, that was my... Because, <laughs> like, that was the first time I had seen a Star Wars movie in a theater. And it had just... It was the first time in my life I watched it, and I was like, this is a big deal that I'm watching this. Yeah, if, if I, that makes sense. Ooh, that was two thousand and five. Yeah, I definitely saw that in theaters. I remember falling asleep. Uh, oh, yeah. I was not a big Star Wars kid. I remember it, it like that heavy eyed thing, where you're uh-huh. trying to stay awake, and then just two minutes pass, and you open your eyes, and you're like, I didn't even know that I did that just now. Yeah. So did, that was like that the in, entirety of that movie for me. I've only ever done that in one movie. That was uh, Les Misérables. The new one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Russell think, Crow? Yeah. In my defense, I think it was it was like the it was Christmas, I think, that day, and I had barely slept the night before, so I slept through like the first like five to ten minutes of it. Prisoner two four six oh one. And yeah, then all I of a sudden they're too. doing Master of the House and you're like, Whoa, 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 whoa. Right, like I woke up when he was like running out of the church or something, and I was like, What the fuck is going on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that little tangent. Yeah, the earliest one big one that i remember seeing in the theater would have been um star wars episode three okay first one i'm all but certain i actually saw in the theater would have been toy story 2 then that's all right that's good yeah memories <laughs> um moving right along from that uh yes, yes yes so let's say that a drama based on your life premieres you know it's being filmed it gets games it comes out yes uh who would you want to play you or who do you think would play you either of those i and this is imagining i can't think of a, a younger actor but i'm imagining if like a little bit later in my life i'm imagining um i think its name's colin firth uh irish actor he's been in just a yeah. couple of uh, huge things he was the father in saving mr banks yeah i'm aware i i uh i gotcha i know yeah. who he be. I, I think he'd be most accurate to just like either looking like me or um you know portraying me in some way uh, for a younger one i'm a younger actor i'm really not sure i haven't kept up with a lot of younger actors for me to know for certain um like Donald gleason maybe i don't know i mean he's a redhead <laughs> he'd have to wear a wig but that's the most i can think of um yeah I, one thing i can think of um a person i'd like to play my dad because they genuinely actually look very similar, would be um, Daniel Craig. 
Oh yeah, the, I can yeah, see the Bond that. Movies. Like my like it's it was really weird. A, a picture of Daniel Craig on a magazine came out. I think around the time of um, it must have been Girl with a Dragon Tattoo. Um, that when ho- seen from a distance looks identical to my dad. It's really weird, and I can never unsee it. And I was like, oh my god. <laughs> And so I was like, yeah, that's that's not bad. Yeah, that's the that's the most I could think of though. It's like Colin Firth definitely would be my choice to play me. Obviously, he's an older person, uh, like in like I don't know, thirties. I don't know how old he is. Yeah. Yeah. You. Oh yeah. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, I like, I don't know. I'm not really good with new actors. I they'd uh-huh. probably be dead. Um. Well, right. Oh, let's say well, you, you're. Let's say you're allowed to choose an actor at any point in their life, living or dead. Okay. Well, I, mm, maybe it could be an animated drama, and I could be voiced by Billy West or something. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Fair enough. I don't know. It, honestly, it'd probably be someone like Josh Gad, but more wiry. Oh, okay. Yeah. No. I, I see I, a Josh I, I Gad that. playing me, but he'd have to. He'd have to. Tame, like tame his hair and, and right. slim down a bit. Honestly, at this point, not that much. I I put on weight. Oh, <laughs> uh, not a lot. But was that on your end? What? I heard a horn honk. Oh no, I, I didn't hear anything. Okay, doesn't matter. Um, so <laughs> it, it'd probably be I someone just, like that. Maybe I just laughed funnily. <laughs> uh, it was. Pff, you are um. You are. What's his name from Police Academy then? Because that was a perfect impression. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, fair enough. Yeah, no, nah, I didn't hear anything. Uh, my mother. Uh, would definitely be played by Melissa McCarthy. Oh, okay. I see a lot of I see a lot of similarities between the two of them. Uh, my mother is one of the few people that uh, can make me consistently actually laugh. Uh, nice, nice. And Melissa McCarthy is kind of the same way. There's not a lot of comedians right now, or comedians even, uh, that I find that funny. But I don't know. She uh, Something about the way she delivers lines or something. It's not like pure awkward like Kristen Wiig or something. Right. So I, I, I know I mentioned it on our Ghostbusters one, and I think I mentioned it when we did the Oscars recap bit. But uh, Melissa McCarthy... Makes me laugh, and I can see her playing my mother. But, hmm. no, I, I think I think that's good. Yeah, that's about it. I could I don't I think, think I could pin anyone else down in such a short amount of time. Sarah Jessica Parker could probably play my play my mom. Maybe she was a bit yeah. more intense. Yeah. But beyond yeah. that, I can't really think of anyone in particular. Yeah. <laughs> my mom's my mom feels like a very unique person. <laughs> We're casting our whole lives now. Right. My fifth grade music teacher would be played by Whoopi Goldberg. Jim Parsons. <laughs> Whoopi Goldberg. Oh, that would have been awesome. Oh yeah. It's sister act and everything. Okay. Um Yes, yes, yes. Uh ooh, this one. Wait, I, I asked that question. <laughs> oh wait, did you? Yeah, I was looking through the list and I was like, wait a minute, I just asked that question. Yeah, it's... so isn't it my turn? Yeah. Okay, just making sure. Oh, um, <laughs> Yeah, because that's what I was about to ask. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, this one in particular, because I also want to answer it. Are there any time periods or settings that you strongly dislike and may prevent you from enjoying a movie? Yes. Um, so, building up a bit, I'm not a huge fan of westerns. Mm-hmm. But since going away to college, I watched a few. And we did True Grit, two True Grits on the show. Yeah. So I've softened a bit on westerns. I think I can get into them now, but for, but it's really hard for me to find one that I enjoy. Mm-hmm. But I, I don't just hate the setting anymore. Uh, medieval fantasy, I have always hated with a really? passion. I cannot get into those genres. Something like Lord of the Rings is so much fantasy separated from medieval that I can still watch it. Mm-hmm. But if it is like castles and knights and i i can't i can't do it something about it is a complete turn off i can't watch it without yeah. being bored out of my skull yeah it just feels kind of uncreative in a way yeah like is it, it just yeah it, it very, really does it kind of it reeks of like you know elementary school like fan fiction kind of thing you know 
It's like someone who, <laughs> exactly someone... what you're talking about. I used to write stories uh-huh. on pieces it, of paper in class. It, it feels like the kind of like early level like mental fantasies you would make for yourself before you got like creative. Yeah. It's just like I'm a hero in a like magical like medieval Europe land or something or something to that effect. It's like all the yeah. most boring parts of Arthurian legend. And and maybe it's be- just because I'm so into cryptozoology and stuff, so I know about all these different creatures from different cultures that are supposed to exist. So mm-hmm. it, it might be that. I might be acknowledging my bias here. But I think dragons are are really lazy. They're such an easy go-to, like, ah, uh, it's a dragon. There you go. Yeah. Easy creature. Get it done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so. It seems like there's a lot of, you know, creativity that could be done that just dragons just kind of just kind of fall flat on. A lot yeah, of modern I, iterations kind of try to spin on it, but even then, they're still not great. Yeah, I remember reading about a dragon that had legs and hopped around like a kangaroo. <laughs> a marsupial dragon or something. I don't know if it was Australia-related or not, but I was always like, why am, why am I not seeing that? Yeah. Maybe some Probably because it's too goofy-sounding, but I'd rather see that than, oh, it's another lizard flying around breathing fire. Great. The only dragon in recent media that I'm I even slightly gave a shit about was like the brief character John Hurt voiced in the Merlin show, mm. which like it's still my favorite story because like the creators of it were like we couldn't possibly get John Hurt and they asked him he was like sure and I was like oh <laughs> so that's why you ask yeah <laughs> that's why I ask um but for me I have a clear cut answer for this one um both time period and setting uh american revolutionary era is the most boring Ooh. and gung-ho fucking period for films and tv shows of all freaking time because uh. it's always made by an american source and so it's just stupid like 99 percent of them aren't even that historically accurate and even if they are they're still like super glorifying the age and everything like i know the show uh john adams with um paul giamatti oh great my show. god no <laughs> like i won't lie great show if only for the performances but my god it's just the setting and just the boring like locales and you know sets and everything it's just it's so dull in every way it's just people talking about like you know a really pretty bland clear-cut underdog versus you know stronger enemy story except everyone's got like shitty haircuts and has all everyone inexplicably has regionless american accents already where it's like fucking you guys are still english technically right now what the hell (laughs) let me tell you john you bring up a really good point that's not something i thought about i still think i hate medieval more but that is that is really close Mm -hmm. um it just screams kevin costner to me uh that or Mel Gibson. If or Mel because, Gibson, yes. If only because of the Patriot, which fucking the Patriot. <laughs> but uh, John Adams is literally a film I or a mini series, whatever, that I have not seen in a decade. <laughs> but it still sticks with me in the fact that it is it is something I bring up to people as one of the most boring things that I've ever had to sit through. I had to sit through it in middle school really? as a part of it as a part of an American history class. Wow. Uh the only not dull section of that movie was the five minute sex scene with Paul Giamatti and whoever the woman was that played Abigail, and that was just disgusting. So, <laughs> no thanks. Uh, yeah, do you re- do you remember that? I, I didn't watch the whole show. I'd only like my brother was really into it for some godforsaken reason, and so I'd occasionally be in the room when he was watching it. That's the most I can remember of it. Like. I remember like key every now and again key scenes. Like I remember the ending because I was really happy because he dies. And I remember <laughs> I remember when fucking George Washington gets sworn in and it's as the first president. And it's the most fucking nauseating America hell yeah bullshit. I'm just like God, this is so dull. <laughs> like yeah. I only the only saving grace for that show is just I think Paul Giamatti is just a fantastic actor. Um but even but beyond that it's just it's such a boring period of history to do anything literally any other period in history in any other part of the world is infinitely more interesting <laughs> it's just uh. and I, I i would i would love to see a film of that done from the perspective of someone other than an american 
or like made by someone that isn't made by like a non-american group that might actually be able to do it some unbiased justice but that's well, probably not gonna happen <laughs> uh, never mind i'm not gonna bring it up i i may text you or group me message you later okay. i swear i was reading something like just the other week about uh, uh, a, a film that took place during the American Revolution that fell flat on its face, and people cite the fact that it was an entirely British production. So <laughs> I need to I need to locate that. I don't remember what it's called. Hell, but, I might uh, love it. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, if only for just a fucking difference of context. Uh, okay, moving right along. Yes. Um, what movie would you want to play at your funeral? Ooh, um, oh, damn, I had a, I had a really good one earlier because I don't want to just pick one of my just general all purpose favorites because I think that's just kind of dull. Um, yeah. Force just, everyone to sit through 2001. Right, right, right. Ooh, uh, I remember it's, I mean, this is an, another favorite of mine, but, um, I think it's one that I just think that needs to be appreciated more and if anything you know i have a captive audience at that point um but i but also one like i think just resonates with me um the the wind rises the studio ghibli miyazaki oh film. it's like you'll make them cry too yeah exactly like you're at my funeral you better cry yeah exactly and so i just i i i adore that movie and i think it's just you know I think it has a very deep message, and I think, you know, a lot of people are just kind of down on it, A, because, like, you know, it's glorifying essentially what became a major weapon of war, and B, yeah. and B that it's just not terribly like Miyazaki's other stuff. But it's, it's, like, not, it's not that whimsical. Uh, right. The most whimsical part of it would be him talking to the other designer in his dreams. Besides right. that, it's fairly on the ground, which is ironic given the subject matter. <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just, I think it's, I think it's, just, it really just kind of is a cool little take on a very real subject of, you know, the idea of what is like, even someone that's deeply passionate about something and deeply wanting to make something that's truly good and beautiful in a society that kind of demon and that kind of pushes that to the side, it can be demonized and that sort of thing. I just think it has a deeper message that and that should be, you know, witnessed more. And plus, you know, it's just it's visually stunning. I think it's I honestly think it's one of his best looking films. Yeah. Yeah. His other stuff can be a little cluttered to me. I I agree. I like that film. Yeah, yeah, I I love it. Uh, it's a good one. What about you? What crazy stuff is going to play when you, as they're lowering your casket or something? What about me out in a feet in the cemetery? Yeah. They got to have a projector I, hooked up. I guess I should say at the wake or whatever the fuck. But yeah, um, but yeah. It'll be woke, all right. Um, <laughs> Jesus hell. I don't know the aforementioned film about my life. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, it's like the one go. with skinny Josh Gad running around. I don't yeah. know. Um. Uh, Infinity War, I don't, and when he snaps his finger, they push me into the the. I'm gonna cremate me. Uh, there's so many good paths that can be taken uh, for something yeah, like you're, this. You're taking advantage uh, of the road. I was just I was doing something kind of like heartfelt and everything because I could. I'm not that creative. You you you're you're taking advantage. <laughs> you know, the day the clown. Hopefully, by the time I die, day the clown cried will have already been out, so I could have watched it. But maybe something like that. <laughs> uh, fair enough. So everyone can see Jerry. Oh no! Okay, I know, I know, I know. Uh -huh. uh, something like Freddy got fingered, so that everyone that that is at my funeral knows that my death isn't the worst thing in the world. <laughs> All right, fair enough. There's always something wow. worse than death. Oh my god. Yeah, god damn. <laughs> yeah, no shit. They'll, they'll walk. Uh, the, what the what that'll do though in the end is they'll walk out and they'll associate that movie with like they'll associate you with that movie from then on. It's like God, fuck that guy. <laughs> if, if I get lucky, they'll associate me with Rip Torn. <laughs> I mean, I, it'll be one degree of separation between me and Rip Torn. <laughs> That's what we all we, we want in the end is like the the shortest degree separation with our favorite actor. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, that's 
that's a good one. <laughs> All right. I mean, it's not, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear you. <laughs> All, All right. right, back on to you. Yes, 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 yes. What is a particular decade for film you tend to prefer prefer over all others? Uh, definitely the seventies. And yeah. I feel like I mentioned this on uh, the episode we did the day the day of the jackal, just mm-hmm. because I mean because the original takes place in the seventies. Uh, I like the style and the feel of most films from the seventies. I feel like they are just at that period with color picture where I can really enjoy it because early color films uh, can be really grainy. And then as you get into late eighties into the nineties, you start getting uh, really crystal clear. And I like that, that sort of faded glaze that's on a lot of films of the seventies. Oh yeah. Uh, And I mean, during that time period, there were, uh, we started getting more B horror, which I'm always a fan of. Like, uh, I think deathbed, the bed that eats was in the (laughs) late seventies. Um, there were a lot of heist and sting movies, which are always fun. Like, uh, the Godfather, the sting, you know, things like that. Yeah. So I, I, I'd say the seventies. Yeah. It's for me, it's a straight toss up between the seventies and the eighties. Um, seventies for pretty much the same reason as you. Um, I'm trying to remember. I don't think cool hand Luke was the seventies. I think that was late sixties. Yeah. just that just that general era of like the kind of the semi glaze as you put it of a lot of those uh, over a lot of those colored films but it's it's hard to knock the 80s cuz so much came out like that's really when hollywood like hit its stride with technology and just ability to produce um you know majority of spielberg stuff came out around that time it's just it it was it, it kind of it hit a good point when it came with action and tech so it's i'm probably gonna end up leaning towards 80s yeah, like we got you know, war game 80s gave us war game yeah exactly <laughs> 80s <laughs> gave us you know the reason ernest klein has a career <laughs> oh no okay. so you know d- damn it for that but you know <laughs> otherwise it's 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 you know mm-hmm. it's it's the kind of thing it's like you know it's movies of that era that kind of gave us the idea for this show so it's really like or rather the remakes of movies from there so it's it's really hard to say anything other than the 80s for me just if only for that because it's just it's been so well you know with good reason influential oh that's fair i hear you mm-hmm. not that terribly makes sense creative to but you know i i try to think back on stuff in like the 50s or everything it's like you know not a lot of great stuff came out in the 50s it's like, yeah. <laughs> good things did come out, but just, like, not enough for me to say, like, that was the best decade. Mm-hmm. I, and if if only, if it weren't for the earlier half of the 2000s, I would have said between 2000 to 2010. Because there's a lot of good stuff between, like, 04 and, like, 0, like 12 that came out. But the first half of the of 2000s, not a lot of great stuff came out. That was a weird period, period of time. Yeah. <laughs> We, we got to give it time because nostalgia always takes effect, but we also have to see uh, how we have to see the influence and how it affects uh, the directors of tomorrow. Right. Because that automatically like there's so many films in the past that have come out and either the critics hate it or audiences hate it or no one sees it. Mm-hmm. But someone sees it like Steven Spielberg watched this movie in his living room and then it impacts like an entire other generation of movie making. So that definitely that definitely has an effect, too. So with with films coming out now, I think we just got to we just got to wait it out a bit to yeah. see what'll what'll truly be remembered. And, and like, there's definitely some big names that are around nowadays that are really kind of setting that bar like, you know, be like. Wes Anderson or Guillermo del Toro just like kind of changing the scene a little bit and that sort of thing that I I definitely see what you mean yeah so, yeah yep all right uh Your okay turn. so uh hmm. on on <laughs> since we're talking about influential aspects of film uh what is the mo- what do you think is the most damaging movie ever made uh not just bad but but damaging in some way to society itself yes 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 yes. uh 
this one I had thought about my initial uh, excuse me my initial gut reaction would have been um jaws because of just how it harshly it impacted just like you know at least america's conception of the ocean and of sharks and everything and that how it's kind of demonized both of those things you know fear like fear of the ocean spiked up really badly and um you know shark cullings became huge and everything and i just you know i'm such a lover of the ocean in general that it's just it, it kind of hurts my heart to think about that um but then if i kind of started thinking about it more and i was like you know th as straightforward as that is i think there are more damaging films and i kind of thought about it harder and i really gotta say um michael bay's transformers because it set the bar or at least it set the precedent for you can make a live action dark gritty reboot of some old property and it can be successful incredibly successful but it doesn't have to be good you can just make schlock essentially and if it has nostalgic value and a high enough effects budget it will make you millions and i think that has been one of the worst things to happen to hollywood ever <laughs> yeah it is it is set the trend like everyone will go on about you know disney remaking all their stuff to live action i'm pretty sure i'm willing to put money on it that the michael bay's transformers was the the trendsetter for that that was the earliest form i can really think of that really having such a big impact it's it's just it's hard to forgive that in any respect and also just the fact that i fucking hate michael bay i think he's a piece of shit <laughs> that's a, those are some good points yeah, especially that last one yep <laughs> <laughs> as yeah and just it's it was it, it's it's crazy to really think on that because there's so many like a lot of like the trend of remakes could even be somewhat attributed to that obviously remakes have always existed but you know that was a a, a gritty dark reboot built off of a, an 80s cartoon that existed solely to sell toys you know so it's like this is a hasbro fucking thing that's turned into like a dark gritty adventure with yeah you know crappy performances and crappy directing and crappy everything with the exception of you know the explosions and the actions are admittedly decent but otherwise it's not worth it <laughs> at least for all the crap points. it's caused <laughs> So I, I uh, blame that one wholeheartedly for the trend. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. What about uh, you? I'm sure you I, might have a couple... You Your lexicon of movies is far deeper than mine, at least with age. And so uh, you might have one that it turn, ends up is like, no, this is the one that set an even worse trend. While possibly true, I actually did think about this one for an unhealthy amount of time. Oh, Just really? like, well, what? What? And and I sort of boiled it down to maybe not affecting society at large in such a damaging way, but mm -hmm. affecting it in affecting it in a way that personally offends me, and that's that I don't I mean. like. No, so no, I, mean, I mean that's fair. I mean like this is a purely opinionated piece, right? So this is by no means obscure, but mm -hmm. I really do think Disney's Aladdin the 1994 93 whatever animated feature harmed mm -hmm. the animated movie scene a lot more than it helped uh how so I'm, and I'm, i really I'm do think deeply that. curious about this um so it's around this time we have it, let me take you through this we have little mermaid and we have voices like uh jody benson and Pat Carroll, uh, Buddy Hackett, was mm -hmm. in it. He was probably the biggest name in that. A, a comedian that was in some movies in the 50s and the 60s in sort of a minor role as Scuttle the Seagull. Uh, and then, once we hit... I, I can't remember if uh, Beauty and the Beast came before or after Aladdin. I think it came after Aladdin. But uh, once we hit Aladdin... We start seeing this trend because we have bigger name stars in it, mainly Robin Williams, who, which Robin didn't want this, but he became the driving force of that movie. Right. Um, which is why he didn't show back up for the second one or for the TV show. Well, he probably wouldn't have done the TV show anyways. Right. But um, that sort of set, started setting a trend into motion, like uh, a picture like The Lion King. Uh, 
where voice actors or voice talent started being moved to the side in favor of bigger names because Disney saw the drawing power that they had when they had like uh uh it's going to be Matthew Broderick in the starring role and we have uh JTT from Home Improvement he's going to be there <laughs> uh and stuff like that and that has affected us hugely way down the line movie animated movies coming out animated features it's just a cavalcade of faces and voices you know right you can um, even have that with you know full circle enough with a modern aladdin with you know will smith yeah yeah i would i would say that uh who with alan tudyk is iago, iago now oh, yeah. um which that you know fair enough <laughs> have, have you heard have you heard about the reviews they haven't been great yes i did <laughs> we'll I'm touch so, that at some point <laughs> i'm so damn happy <laughs> uh but that being said that's that's not the only thing uh the character of the genie himself i think mm -hmm. sort of harmed animated movies because he works well enough in his own environment i'm sure everyone's heard that argument he can make pop culture references he's a genie he's magic it works uh um, right i'm not gonna harp on that because i do agree so it's not like that's a dissenting opinion there um mm -hmm. but that really paved the way for sort of smart out and, and iago didn't help but yeah, it no. paved the way for smart alecky characters whose only purpose is for comedic effect you get into lion king with timon and pumbaa who are definitely more comedy than they are plot related but they still affect the plot in some ways they're they're sort of his pseudo parents they take play, part in the final fight at pride rock so they're they're still sort of affecting the plot okay um Beauty and the Beast, uh, ironically, didn't have a lot of these problems. That's why it was nominated for Best Picture, I think. Yep. Um, but as you go further and further down the line, we start getting more, all right, I'm the hero or heroine. Here's my quirky sidekick who does nothing for anybody and just says one-liners and is probably voiced by a comedian that you saw in a Comedy Central roast one time. <laughs> and that is all animated movies are anymore. Yeah, it kind of feels it. I and I was thinking about it, and maybe I maybe I haven't worded it in worded my my qualms with it in the best way because the movie itself I still like and I still think it's fine, but the the things that it introduced into the animated culture itself, which has persisted past hand drawn into uh, CGI films, I think have been pretty damaging to the medium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I. I see what you mean. But that's just a film theory, huh? Oh, God, no. Stop it. <laughs> okay. Get that shit out of here. All right, it's gone. I got rid of it. <laughs> well, on the on the subject of, you know, Robin Williams, uh -huh. uh, who, is, who is your favorite character actor? Mm. Character actors. Okay. So, uh... I'm also curious to see what you define as a character actor because, you know, I myself have a few possible answers, but they might just be blatantly wrong. <laughs> yeah, I think the most widely held belief is that a character actor is someone known for pop just popping up in things, being supporting roles. Mm. Uh, a person that you would never give a lead role to. An okay. actor sort of like that. Is, I, I, I think that's the most common definition. Just like you'll see them go, oh, get, oh that guy. Yeah. Until you learn okay. their name. I gotcha. And uh, I really like Danny DeVito. I'd say for the most part, he's a character actor. Here recently, he's been not been getting lead roles, but I think he's become more in the public conscious. So I think even if he's not a lead actor, he's sort of moving away from a character actor just yep. because he's so recognizable at this point. So it's kind of a toss up for me between uh, J.K. Simmons who, again, in the Day of the Jackal episode, that was like the one redeeming factor for the Jackal for me, is that I love J.K. Simmons. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Uh, he was great in Whiplash. He does great voices. Mm -hmm. And most anything he, he's in, he is J. Jonah Jameson. Yeah. At I, this point. I will, I will never see him as anything else. Yeah. he He's great. Uh, but also Dom DeLuise, who was in a... He, he, he was a big-time... Uh, comedy actor uh character actor in comedies i'd say uh mm -hmm. so fairly recognizable i know him mostly for voiceover roles 
primarily in Don Bluth things because it feels like every single Don Bluth film outside of Land Before Time had Dom DeLuise doing a major voice. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know. For me, it would be one of one of those two. I think Dom DeLuise or J.K. Simmons. I'm locking it in. Okay, I, I, I can see that. What about you? Uh, by that definition, it would have to either be um, Willem Dafoe or Michael Douglas. I think that, like they're both kind of similar. I think it's, uh, so. That's why I'm lumping them together. Um, just I think Willem Dafoe has just been in a lot of kind of fun, crazy things, and he's just kind of willing to go kind of all out in his pieces. Like um, I'm not a huge fan of Boondock Saints, but I think he makes the film for me. Um, or wait, no, that's is that the name of it? That that film with the Boondock two, Saints? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The two Irish brothers and shit. Yeah, um, Colin. Uh, uh something or other yeah um i know it's, i know one of them's norman reedus that's the only thing i remember yeah um so him and then i think michael douglas is just like i think i mostly really just like his voice i think he's got one of the more unique voices um for actors i've known um you know i had mentioned recently that i had seen romancing the stone and i thought he was great in that and like when in a lot of his i've been mean to see uh, more stuff they featured in in when, like some of his younger years but I, I just think he's just you know anytime he's in a film i think he's just kind of he ends up kind of stealing the spotlight whenever he's there it's just i think he just gives kind of a pretty genuine performance not necessarily a standout but it just i just like him as a guy <laughs> if he kind of got hit like you know I, I feel like i could actually like talk to him <laughs> as a person i feel yeah, like there's a lot understand of understand me right exactly i feel like there's a lot of actors out there that even that kind of come off as every men sort of types that I would not be able to stand with, with them in a room for a long period of time. But I, I think he's, he just seems kind of genuine and he just yeah. seems to enjoy what he does. That's fair. I think I would, I think I'd put, I think that, uh, uh, Michael Douglas is a, a little more lead than Willem Dafoe is, yeah. but I, yeah, I see where, you, where you're coming fr- uh, from with those. Yeah. I, I don't, I can't, I can't really think of a whole lot of things he's been in as far as a lead other than like because even in romancing the stone he's not the main character he's he's just like a uh, like a male protagonist as well but um inside to uh uh kathleen turner yeah is it i I believe so i want to say yes Mm. um yeah it would be a toss-up between those two and i think just willem dafoe is just just hilarious and plus is, is the green goblin and everything it's like that's what I'm saying. It's like he even in all his, he's done a bunch of ridiculous roles, but I think he's completely believable in all of them. Hey, Willem Dafoe and J.K. Simmons together at last. Oh yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, all right. So um, that Excuse being me. said, what? Oh, uh, uh, what were you gonna say? I, I was just gonna, I, I figured you were gonna ask me another question. I was. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. That aside. <laughs> Um, I think we've touched on this a little bit, but I, I, I'm willing to hear any qualms you may have regarding mm. it. Uh, would you rather not be able to watch, uh, watch any film between 1950 and 1990 ever again, or only ever be able to watch movies from that period? It, I, I'd have to say never be able to watch ones from that period again, if only because I'm my optimistic self is still hoping it's still like i i still see that a lot of good modern movies are coming out like you know there are plenty of good ones okay a couple of good ones in the 90s <laughs> um and you know like the 2000s have produced a few good things and plus like i said earlier there's a whole lot of really big named big names coming out now between you know anderson del toro um uh jordan peele um and so I, I just, I think it would just kind of be doing a disservice to kind of lock myself out of seeing those, despite you know, pretty, pretty well set in stone that some of the greatest films of all time came out in the nineteen fifty nineteen ninety period. Um, I'd even say even farther back to nineteen thirty. Um, but yeah, yeah, I'd have to, I'd have to go with the ones that are just outside of that period. Okay. Uh, for me, I would say only within that time period because that's mm. 
the time period where most of what I watch already takes place, so I don't feel like it would affect me too much. Right. I kind of <laughs> most. I kind of figured. I yeah, I kind of figured that one would be kind of where you leaned. Again, most uh, most B horror is in that period. And oh no, I never get to watch Puppet Master again. What will I do? Um, yeah. The the only real downside I see to it. Uh, I mean, the big names are coming out. I guess I, I wouldn't be able to watch those, but I don't know if I would necessarily know that they were happening. I guess that's a, that's a way deeper hypothetical that we're not discussing. Right. Um, I think the most upsetting part would be, like, the universal monster movies of the 30s and the 40s, the early 40s. I would miss out on most of those right which i really i really do like a lot of those like frankenstein bride of frankenstein the wolfman st- uh, things like that the invisible I, man i, guess, I wouldn't I guess be able to I, watch those i guess when i premised this uh question i should have written it would you rather not be able to see a film after 1990 or never be able to see a film before 1990 because i okay. think that's that probably does a bit more justice if you want well, to answer it like that <laughs> Well, nah, the way it's written, uh, I, that's the one downside to it, but I still think that I would end up going with between 50 and 90. Okay. Yeah, I kind of figured that's a that's a pretty good period of time to kind of chunk it out. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Me, now then, let me see another one. Ooh. Oh yeah, um, Edward Fox's jackal and Bruce Willis's jackal are hunting each other down. Who do you think gets the kill? Okay. So from what we've seen of both of the jackals, yes. Uh, in my in my in my thought process here, uh, they both are intricate planners and they plan things out to the nth degree and have backups for most every case. Yep. Um. As soon as Bruce Willis's version of the Jackal, as soon as his plan falls through and he has no backup, he loses his mind and he's completely unpredictable. So yeah. I I don't know that Edward Fox's Jackal would be able to, if, if Bruce Willis gets to that point, I don't know that Edward Fox would be able to tell where he's going and I think Bruce Willis would end up getting the final kill. Mm-hmm. Just he might be too... Pure manic. Yeah, he might be too reckless... But I think with a character, I think with a character whose entire personality, from what we've seen, is based around designing things and yeah. having fallbacks. I think once that's out the window, I don't know if he'll be able to come back from that. I gotcha. You see, I kind of like. I, I, the way I started thinking about this is like I wasn't sure it's like would each of them have their own respective resources like if, if that's the case then Bruce Willis hands down because you know he's okay, able he to has get, that big ass gun yeah he has that big ass gun he has like modern amenities he can get and shit like it wouldn't be completely easy like you know just in the same context uh, in, bleh, in the same context um, Edward Fox was able to disappear more easily in you know his time period um, so assuming they could each have those skills, it would still be Willis. On an even playing field, um, I'd almost say for the very reason that you said that uh, Bruce Willis would get the kill, I'd say Edward Fox would. Because I think once you get to the point of being manic and kind of breaking down out of reason, I think Edward Fox would keep his head and be able to, you know, kind of slip through, like kind of work past the crazy shit that bruce willis would be doing at that point because he wouldn't be doing any kind of plan at that point he'd just be kind of going by the seat of his pants which yeah. leaves a noticeable trail of destruction as we saw <laughs> that's so, fair so i think i think edward fox if given equal technological levels you know despite whatever time era i think edward fox would get it because i think he's just even even level all the way throughout like even when we saw you know in the film like when he has an opera when he sees that he thinks that the plan has completely fallen through he cuts and goes and just like you know hangs out with that one lady um for a while but then when he sees <laughs> yeah. that there's an opportunity to you know get things going again he immediately gets back on it and like straight up kills her and just like hits it and is good to go all the way back on so i think he's a bit more controlled and at least determined in his actions versus bruce willis is just kind of like 
he's just kind of doing a lot of this shit for fun. Like he he like he killed you know Jack Black's character and everything in the most insane fucking manner. So I think yeah. I think in the end he would just kind of be pretty easy to take down comparatively. All right. But you know it. You know in the it it just goes to show an Irish ex-con was able to take him down. <laughs> well, not even ex-con. He was still a con. Yeah, I see your points there. Yeah. All right. Uh, hmm. Where to go from here? Uh, which of the two Scarface protagonists would you rather have dinner with? Ooh. Um. Probably, probably the 1932 one, since he's like, you know, he's Italian. He probably, if he didn't cook himself, he'd probably know a great place to go. Um, <laughs> uh, and the fact that I think he'd have the s- at least noticeable difference of he'd probably be more fun to talk to and more fu- like a more enjoyable dinner guest. He does run the higher risk of just something random setting him off and him just shooting me. But I think that it'd still be a bit better than Tony Montana, um, or like I think that's his name the, in the nineteen seventies. Yeah, yeah. Um, Tony Montana, who would just kind of, just kind of be a jerk throughout it, and would probably still kill me, but he would be like you know pretty obvious about it. It wouldn't like something wouldn't set him off. He'd probably just be like, "I'm done with you now," and he just shoots me. So. I, if I'm gonna get like randomly shot, I'd at least like the you know the night to be at least pleasant. So I think <laughs> I think 1932 would probably be better. You know, I I would go with the 32 version too because uh-huh. I I feel like he would be nicer. Uh, he 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 would be quicker to uh probably something setting him off or like upsetting him. Yeah, and then he would pull out his gun, but he's not as quick to anger. As yeah. uh, Al Pacino's character is, uh, yeah. so it'd be nicer. And you know, he whistles before he commits his murders, so, so I might be able to flip the table or something. Yeah, because you know, in that situation where we know the context, we'd at least know what's going to happen. Versus everyone else in that film was like, "He's whistling. Why is he doing that?" Yeah, <laughs> we'd just be like, "Nope." <laughs> except for Lovo, he well, knew. Except for Lovo, but he, at that point, he didn't really late. have much situation to get out of. He deserved it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. And, it was concise. Yeah. Plus I just like Italian food. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Ooh, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Ooh, uh what's a film you wish we could discuss on the show but know that we can't for one reason or another? Oh boy. Uh you know I actually did I, I had an answer for this one. I just can't remember what it was. I mean, I can answer first if you want to think about it. Yeah, how about you uh, do... No, 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 no. Okay, Uh, Brave Little Toaster. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I love that movie, but there's no remake to it, and the sequels came out really quickly, so there's no way we could cover it. But I love that film. Not enough enough people remember it because it was direct to video. Mm Mm-hmm. Um... But at least the first one is a great movie and a great musical too. I love. There's four songs in that movie, and I love all of them. Now mm-hmm. the first one's okay, but the other th- the the other three are great. So okay, if only they would remake it just so I would have an excuse to talk about it on the show. <laughs> right. Okay, I guess I-, I love that movie. Yeah, it's it's awesome. <laughs> uh, you. For me, like this one seems a little obvious since I've stated to be one of my favorites, but I gotta say, Hunt for Red October, because it would be so cool to be able to talk about a lot of those, you know, Cold War era thrillers, which we we kind of did with Jackal, but that one was kind of over like over dramatized, um, right? And I just I I absolutely adore that film. I think it's done so well with the with um, you know, just portraying that entire scenario. And I just, I don't think we'll ever get the chance to, because I cannot imagine they would remake it, because it is so based on its own time period. It's Mm. like, you really can't have that kind of story with, like, modern technology and modern surveillance equipment, that you'd have the, the, you know, kind of cat and mouse, you know, chase scenes that they have. 
Hmm. And so while just... I do, What's that? while I do agree with you, it is based on a book, so there could be a chance. I mean, we'll have fair. to look into that. I mean, fair. It's it's just at the same time, it's one of those things I desperately kind of hope they don't remake it because I think it's pretty much <laughs> perfect as it is. It's always not perfect as a movie. I can I can probably tear it apart, but I do think it's incredibly well made. And I just I just think it's just flat entertaining and is able to make what would typically be a really boring topic seem exciting. You know, just the submarine warfare is pretty pretty dull when you get right down to it. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, just right. that, yeah, that one I doubt or at the very least hope we'll ever get a chance to. Or not. Okay. Whatever. That's good. Uh all right. Now big question for you. Huge okay. question. Is Arnold Schwarzenegger actually a good actor? <laughs> um, no, <laughs> I, I, I really don't think he is. Like I, I got like even thinking about it for a little bit. Any film that he's been in, his most famous film is about him being emotionless and, you know, inhuman, literally, like like being the Terminator, and that that that's not a good actor that's just that's just like that's the most he could do that's his most iconic role it's the role i was born to play baby and any other movie where he's had to do anything beyond either being emotionless he has to just be like shouty and like just the image of testosterone like in a like sense of like um alien uh, alien um uh, pre- uh the predator Right. Which you know, the Predator is a great film. I won't diss it, but it's just he's not a good actor in it. He's just he's just doing, you know, extreme macho man stuff in it, and in every film he's ever in, and yeah. he's done a couple slightly better things um, in recent years, mm-hmm. but I still can't say he's a good actor. Like I think the best thing I've seen him in was that movie, fucking Escape Plan or whatever it's called, like with uh, Sylvester Stallone. But I just just because I think he's not a main character and he's able to actually do slightly different stuff with his acting style, but that's not necessarily a good performance so much as just a different one. Yeah, I so. I was gonna say uh, it it kind of depends for me because for mm. the most part I would say no. Like he's in plenty of movies that I like, right. but is he the best actor? Like I like Running Man. Is he the best actor in that movie? Uh, no. He's just kind of there to do what he does. Yeah. But in, I think in recent years, he's grown into it a bit when he's not doing the stereotypical Arnold Schwarzenegger role. I think he's a bit better. Mm-hmm. Uh, I saw Marnie. Uh, I can't remember. I don't remember liking the film that much, but I thought he was pretty good in it because he was really reserved. Mm-hmm. Like you were saying, it, it wasn't it wasn't emotionally distant like something like the Terminator, but it was more quiet, dramatic, and mixed with horror elements. Since the whole movie is like a zombie thing, right? Which in and of itself is done to death. But <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I, I I remember liking him just fine in that. Uh, I'd love to see him in like an actual German film because he does, you know, he speaks German. I've never seen and him. He in is Austrian. Of... Yeah, he's Austrian. I'd love to see him where he's actually speaking his native language. That might be kind of cool. Yeah, in but... a remake of M. Yeah, uh, yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, nah, just yeah, you know, just hard, hard no on the guy. Like uh... we finally settled the debate on yeah. Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> we saw it here, folks. <laughs> all right i think we can each get another one more question in all right you know, we've, we've hit the hour 15 mark so you know but uh, okay but another another very important one um that i should ask of you tim curry or tony j okay i'm gonna talk myself through this one more than i'm gonna talk you <laughs> uh <laughs> Because my initial response is to cheat. Because I like both of them in different ways, depending on the role that they're in. But I think Mm -hmm. I can convince myself to prefer one over the other. Uh, I like Tim Curry when there's comedy behind it. Even if he's in a horror movie or if he's in a drama movie, 
there are instances where his character is still born to have comedy instilled in it, and he's great at that. Yeah. Uh, Tony J. I like more as a voice actor because Tim Curry, especially if you watch him on Duckman, as uh, he he's the main antagonist of that show, King Chicken, mm-hmm. and he has a very particular voice. But the whole aspect of King Chicken is that he can disguise himself. So you'll watch an episode, a character will show up, and it'll be Tim Curry doing a weird voice. And you can kind of tell he's going to become King Chicken later in the episode. And it's (laughs) just going to devolve into that voice, which is kind of cool to watch. Um, It's like you can point it out first. Yeah, you're like, oh, that's Tim Curry. I know what's going to happen. But The audience uh, (laughs) actually has some agency on figuring out who the villain is. Yeah. But like, Tony like J, I just, yeah, okay. like, like the Scooby-Doo no, episodes where they just pull some stuff out of their ass. So it's like, oh, that's my neighbor who you haven't seen before. It's like, what the fuck, Scooby-Doo? <laughs> yeah. Way to cheat me out of an ending, Scooby-Doo. But, yeah. but, uh, but yeah, uh, Tony, <laughs> Tony J's voice, just his voice. He only has the one voice. Mm. I prefer, I prefer that voice to any of the ones Tim Curry does. Right. Just the. It, it's always the same. Most remember him as Frollo in The Hunchback of Notre Dame, which is a great voice. Yes. Uh, but that's all I can really say. I, I do think I I think I think did it quicker than I thought I would, but I prefer Tim Curry just as an overall actor. Yeah. But, it, but man, if Tony J is in an animated show, then Tony J is, like, stealing the show. Mm-hmm. Which he, he kind of does with Tim Curry. They were both in the Mighty Ducks cartoon as antagonists. Oh, and yeah. I think I paid more attention to Tony Jay's character than I ever did to, to Tim Curry's character. So, there you go. I prefer Tim Curry as an actor. but Alright, fair enough. Yeah. I love them both. <laughs> and your consensus on this is? I mean, I mean pretty much Tim Curry by default, because I didn't really know who tony J was th- that much until i had to look him up and i was like oh yeah <laughs> like mm-hmm. you know i like him but you know i I've, I've loved a lot of just tim curry's work just just i just think he's a hilarious actor in general like you know i've loved the you know the argument in like everyone the argument gives for that uh the Stephen king series for of um it when he portrayed pennywise is that he wasn't actually scary but he was an incredibly funny clown. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's like, that's kind of the point I'd imagine. It's like, you know, a clown is going to be able to attract in these little kids and kill them and everything. If he's actually funny. And I was like, yeah, no, this is absolutely fucking hilarious. I like that. And just his random roles. I know he's, um, one of my favorite roles that I didn't realize of him was his part in, uh, red alert three, the video game <laughs> or command, <laughs> command and conquer red alert three alongside yeah. Peter Stormare. <laughs> um he just he plays just some <laughs> that's a good character he plays like some head russian diplomat or something like soviet diplomat and he is absolutely insane and crazy like one of the last lines he has is just like i'll go to the one place capitalism can't be affected or capitalism can't affect me space, <laughs> space. <laughs> and, he's, and, he's, and he's clearly just like cracking up before he says the last line and it's just like okay this is absolutely crazy i love it <laughs> he made and, a ton of bad stuff better it yeah uh congo uh i remember not being very good but he was i think he was the main hunter in that movie and he was great yeah uh Red Alert Three, the game was yeah. kind of shitty. <laughs> Clue is a good movie, but he steals he steals the show in that too. Oh, absolutely. And I, I forgot about Clue as well. Yeah. And obviously, Rocky Rocky Horror. Which the, oh yes, it's it's hard to call that bad. It's hard to call it good, but my God, it is something. <laughs> it is something. Yeah. <laughs> Say what the hell you want about it. Yeah. yeah no, that, yeah. that's good. All right. Yeah. Pretty definitive on that one. Just uh, slightly by default, but, you know, still. So we both agree. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so we're going to close this out on possibly the hottest possible topic. Ooh. Um, <laughs> who do you think is the most overrated director ever? Ooh. You know, my gut reaction, like, when I first came up with this one, I first thought, like, Michael Bay, but I was like, no, people do hate him. 
Um, yeah, plenty of people dislike it. Um, mm, and that it, it's it's kind of tough, but I gotta I kind of gotta say James Cameron, and I know a lot of people dislike him as well, but I he has gained a lot of praise simply because like a lot of like you know he's been the one directing two of some of the biggest box office explosion ex, but biggest box office you know like hits of all time i think three even if you count terminator um but upon looking back at some of his films and i've seen i have seen titanic all the way through his films kind of suck <laughs> i just like i can i give him credit for like knowing audiences well enough to be able to give good experiences and everything like ones that are have just straight up make straight bank but even like looking back on like terminator and terminator 2 they're really not great films they're really boring and like you know the titanic is literally just you know the story of the titanic sinking plus a pretty generic love story over it with albeit a twist ending with you know jack dying but and then avatar is literally just pocahontas i was one of the few people that hated avatar when it came out i i, <laughs> and I was it. in middle school when that came out yeah, you're you're ahead, you're ahead of the curve there <laughs> but uh, i just like i liked it at least initially if only because the visuals but once i started thinking about it i was like my god this really is just like a boring pocahontas um <laughs> so i just i've it's it's hard to, it, he really is just like you know and everyone goes on about it, like you know it, it's the, everyone has the big thing of oh he went down the submarine to go find the titanic and shit and everything and i was like okay cool <laughs> it's like <laughs> that's not in the movie is it it's like you know at least like the story like you know he was searching around for it just to kind of get a location for the titanic but then apparently like they basically accidentally found it yeah um which that itself is kind of cool i guess but beyond that it's like it's not that big a thing you know <laughs> It's like it's a cool scientific judge, like you know, discovery or historical discovery rather. But in the end, the film just kind of kind of dull. And it's like the whole premise of it, you know, it has this older Rose talking to Bill Paxton's character that whole time telling him jack shit, and then just at the end just dumping this thing in the ocean. It's like this could be a historical landmark and put in a museum. Lots of people will find joy from it. Plop. <laughs> <laughs> like, all right, whatever. That, that whole story yeah. basically amounted to nothing. <laughs> it's like, mm. Jack died, you're here, you deposited the most valuable stone in the world into the water. Nothing was gained. Nothing at all. Except a nudie picture of when you were young. <laughs> <laughs> that's the extent of it. Ew. I mean, that's, that was, at least, I, uh, I think she was, like, she was at least partially nude, like, for the drawing. Oh, yeah, you're right, French girl. I remember. Yeah. yeah. So def- yeah, definitely James Cameron. I'm sure there. I'm sure there are other directors I could think of, but he's probably the biggest one. Hmm. What about you? Uh. Oh boy. And feel free to say Spielberg if you want. I won't be offended. I don't. I don't know Nolan. Uh. Oh yeah. Kubrick. You know, no, not Kubrick. He's not. I actually, when I first read this, I was thinking of saying Spielberg. But looking back on it, the reason... I wouldn't say he's overrated because most of his films deserve the praise that they get and he deserves the acclamation for creating them. I don't think I should say someone's overrated just because everyone knows who they are. Yeah. Because I was looking back and I was like, there's not a lot of his stuff that I hate. I don't like AI, but who doesn't, you know? Exactly. Like, even me. Like, that one I kind of just attribute just to the rough history it had. Yeah. So, what would I really be bringing to to the table by saying Steven Spielberg? I'd, I'd essentially be lying because I don't really believe that. Right. Um, I think that more focus is put on him than could be directed towards other famous directors, or mm. other directors just give them some some uh, standing room, you know. But yeah. I mean, he kind he got there for a reason. Yeah. Uh, I really do want to say, and I think I really do believe, uh, Quentin Tarantino. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I absolutely I absolutely agree. Uh, uh, I like my, Reservoir Dogs, a... I like Kill Bill, and uh, I, I like Pulp Fiction, but I feel that I've seen it 
probably three times in my life, and I think I enjoy it less every time I watch it. So I don't know yeah. how much I really do like that film. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. I think... A lot of his stuff, it's kind of Tim Burton-y in that it, it feels the same. You can definitely see his style in it. And oh, yeah. the one thing I can't complain about with Tarantino is character dialogue, because even if it seems pointless, he he really understands the way that people communicate, and I'll give him that. But everything else, just yeah. everything else. Yeah, and it doesn't like it doesn't help that the more you learn about the man, and the more you look back at his films, you're like, wow, this is basically just fetish material for him, isn't it? This stuff, that stuff, can kind of hurt. Yeah. And like I think the one exception with a lot of his stuff for me would be Inglorious Bastards because I th I think it it itself was definitely I think his standout because it's a different it's a departure from usual formula and the fact that you know it did something incredibly impressive it took a very mainstream movie and it said like seventy five percent of its dialogue is in a non English language albeit it's just in like German and French but still it's it's impressive that it's essentially a foreign foreign language film um and the fact that you know really good stand-up performances and it's hard to bash it because it's just it's basically just a fun kill fest of killing nazis which is just like this is it's hard to be down on this <laughs> for that <laughs> respect and it's it's the one of his few ones that are grounded and like it's campy but it's not quite ridiculous it's not quite well I, I should say it's there are moments that are silly but it doesn't quite become campy like kill bill and such like it, it stays just grounded enough that it's like this is pretty cool and it like earns the action that it builds up to but even then the moment you start to look more into it and there's this is like he's very big on exploitative moments and everything like you know there's a scene where one of the like one of only two main female characters ends up getting like tortured by the main character or the other main like male main character like by him putting a finger and a bullet wound on her it's like this is fucked <laughs> it's just, this is just like not fun at all when you get right when you get into details like that and so it's just yeah it's just yeah i i completely agree he was gonna be my second choice i just didn't think i didn't pick him simply because he wasn't hasn't earned quite as much money as cameron <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Since Cameron's just been a basically just box office gold. Yeah, I'd say that Quentin Tarantino is more uh, overrated in, I'd say, the film community. I think a lot of people that consider themselves to be movie buffs or snobs, they're like, his films are so unique in that a lot of them have a plot, but they lack structure. And the way he does dialogue is great. And it's like, I, I agree with some of what you're saying, but you have to enjoy what you're watching, too. Right. And he, he produces, his hit his hit to miss ratio, with me at least, is not that good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, I can't so. like I can even say that I like most of his films. Like, I think his 10th one has just come out. It's uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Um, yeah, which I still haven't seen. I think it's at a limited release currently, but from the plot synopsis I've seen, because I was just curious because I have no intention of seeing it, and just like from the a couple of like early reviews I've seen, it doesn't look good at all. Like even it seems even less structured and more pointless than a lot of his other films. <laughs> so mm. I'm like this, yeah, this just like in the end it kind of ends up like, well, no, I won't, I won't say anything about it just for the sake of anyone else wants to see it. But it just, it just doesn't seem in any way entertaining to me. It just seems it's just kind of like a almost stock standard, you know was once great actor hollywood movie like it oh it, boy it's a it's a movie about hollywood for fuck's sake i've already given my two cents about that i hate those movies <laughs> <laughs> it's just uh, it's just it's if if any movie if there were anyone perfectly suited to do a movie about hollywood giving itself a blowjob once again it would be fucking twitten tarantino <laughs> twitten tarantino i like that yeah i didn't mean to i just kind of choked on my spit but yeah i'm going with it <laughs> yeah it's just yeah uh, he's he's just kind of a prick <laughs> that's great yeah <laughs> you know what a what a way to go out on fucking twitten tarantino <laughs> expecting shirts soon 
right. Uh, anything? Anything you want to close out on? Uh, no, just kind of I mean, like this. Not our usual structure. Just kind of let us meander to a halt on this one. Just I, I'm. I'm. I feel more informed about you as a person as well. <laughs> oh yeah, and likewise, I think that this was uh, this was a healthy experiment, and I felt that it was due. Uh, we hit our one year anniversary like i think two months ago we didn't even mention it so i feel like this was a natural progression of sorts Woo! i'd, I'd blow a party blower if i had one <laughs> and of course we'll be back in uh two weeks as of this release yes, yes. with another regular episode yes whose contents of which i'm currently cannot remember so, <laughs> so we'll discuss uh, it later hooray i'm not in the dark <laughs> all right so uh real quick rundown they remade it at gmail.com at it remade on twitter and they remade it uh at they remade it on instagram go ahead and drop us a review like comments anything like that that you can do to propel us forward into the future hooray <laughs> Exposure. And those would be appreciated. Yeah, just re- just remember we're on we're on most any platform out there. I'm still dealing with Spreaker. I'm thinking I might take us off of Spreaker. I mean, fair enough. Because they won't hold our they won't hold our backlog unless I I give them money. <laughs> They'll only Fuckers. hold it like one ep- one or two episodes at a time. I mean that's how their business works. But I have other places I can put the entire archive of episodes up. So, <laughs> what are you gonna do? <laughs> yeah. We gotta, we gotta have some, you know, backwards compatibility with all this shit. Come on. Yeah, I don't want it to just be lost to the annals of time. I don't keep the stuff on my computer because I don't have storage space for uh, all of the bytes of data right. that these that these hour and a half to two hour episodes take up. So. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. Just give us a like. Give us a comment. Yada yada. Yeah, you know all that. You watch stuff on the internet. You know how it works. Yeah, people have been doing this shit for a while. Yep. All right. Yeah. As always, I am your host, Stuart. And I'm your host, Jacob. And we'll see you next time with our regularly scheduled content. Bye. I'm escaping to the one place that hasn't been corrupted by capitalism. Space!